Hey, everybody, and welcome to There and Back Again. I'm Alistair Stevens. Today, in our 50th session of our exploration of Middle-earth, we wrap up our discussion of Faramir, and we push on from Ithilien to the very borders of Mordor. I just want to roll all of the R's in that phrase because it just sounds very, very good. We have a packed session today. We've got two and a half chapters. Last week, I covered half of a relatively short chapter because we're talking about Faramir, and that demands a certain amount of time and a certain amount of attention. We're going to move much more swiftly this week, not least of all because I have a very hard at. So this is going to be a 90-minute session, start to finish, pinky swear. Let's see what we can do. Before we get started, though, I wanted to extend a quick but very sincere thank you to everyone who has joined me over the course of the last year, who has plunged with me into the works of Professor Tolkien. This isn't just a significant number. This 50th session isn't just significant because it's a nice round number and we as human beings love nice round numbers, but we are also kind of approaching our own crossroads here. As, as Frodo and Sam are departing from Athelion, so we are marking the halfway point of our journey through the works of Professor Tolkien. Right now, the production schedule for there and back again runs to episode 101, uh, which will be a q and I guess, looking back at our discussion of the Silmarillion. That is theoretically going to be our last session some, I don't know, what, 14 months from now, something like that, probably, holding to our, our production schedule over the course of the last year. We're almost certainly going to throw in a few more sessions between here and there because you know how I like to run long and how I like to find new and fascinating tangents to explore spontaneously here during the live sessions. But theoretically, we are now almost halfway through our journey, and I would just like to thank everyone who has been with me through this incredible voyage, who has, has joined me back from the beginning of The Hobbit, those of you who have come in a little later, those of you who have listened to an infeasible number of episodes in order to catch up so that you can join me for these live sessions. It's been a wonderful trip, and I'm looking forward to the back half, if anything, even more than the first half. There are great things ahead of us, great discussions awaiting us. We're going to finish up The Lord of the Rings. We're going to look in turn in depth at each of the six Peter Jackson movies and maybe even throw in a little discussion of some other adaptations. Maybe look a little, a little at some of the uh, full cast audio adaptations, like the one from the BBC. Maybe look a little at the Rankin-Bass animated versions. Talk a little about, uh, about Professor Tolkien's work in adaptation in that form. And then, of course, we're going to delve into the Silmarillion, which is going to be a very different kind of approach to the text, but, but I'm eager to do exactly that. And then, who knows, the road, as they say, goes ever on and on. Let's get into our discussion then of the back half of chapter five, The Window on the West, continuing our discussion from last week, dis continuing our discussion of the wonderful uh, Faramir of Gondor and Nine Princes is asking here in the Crowdcast chat. I wonder what the over-under should be on the number of sessions Alistair will go over. Um, right now we're scheduled for 101. If we get this done in 110, I will be surprised. It's probably going to be more than that, particularly when we hit the Silmarillion and we're really... We're really uh, almost invited by that text to move even more slowly and to, to delve even more deeply and to speculate even more freely about all of the material. And then, of course, as we've discussed, there is some conversation about Unfinished Tales. There is some conversation about maybe looking at Baron and Luthien, maybe looking at some of the attendant works, too. That would be really great. Looking at the children of Hurin, perhaps, and, and delving even more deeply into Tolkien's work. But we'll see. We'll see what we feel like doing when we get there, I guess, is the the uh, only comfort that I can offer at this point. But there's still a lot of The Lord of the Rings to get to. Only two more sessions after this week, two more sessions in The Two Towers. I can't believe we're coming so quickly to the end of this book. It feels as though we only just started. We only just uh, splintered the uh, fellowship back at Parth Gallon, but we're, we're rapidly closing in on uh, on Kirith Ungol now and on all that awaits Frodo and Sam. So stay tuned for that in the next couple of weeks. This is where we're going to pick up today's reading, though, with Faramir opining on the subject of hope. He was the last, said Frodo, but Aragorn was, fo was forced to lead us. He alone knew the way after Gandalf's fall, but had there not been us lesser folk to care for, I do not think that either he or Boromir would have fled. Maybe, but it would have been better had Boromir fallen there with Mithrandir, said Faramir, and not gone on to the fate that waited above the falls of Raros. Maybe, but tell me now of your own fortune, said Frodo, turning the matter aside once again, for I would learn more of Minas Ethel and Osgiliath, of Minas Tirith the long enduring. What hope have you for your city in the long war? What hope have we, said Faramir? It is long since we had any hope. The sword of Elendil, if it returns indeed, may rekindle it, but I do not think it will do more than put off the evil day unless other help unlooked for also comes from elves or men, for the enemy increases and we decrease. We are a failing people, a springless autumn. The men of Numenor were settled far and wide on the shores and seaward regions of the great lands, but for the most part they fell into evils and follies. Many became enamored of the darkness and the black arts. Some were given over wholly to idleness and ease. 
and some fought among themselves until they were conquered in their weakness by the wild man. It is not said that evil arts were ever practiced in Gondor, or that the nameless one was ever named in honor there, and the old wisdom and beauty brought out of the West remained long in the realm of the sons of Elendil the Fair and there, and they linger there still. Yet even so, it was Gondor that brought about its own decay, falling by degrees into dotage, and thinking that the enemy was asleep, who was only banished, not destroyed. Faramir's perspective on the fall of the men of Numenor is singular, I think, because he alone recognizes the value and worth of Gondor, the value and worth of Minas Tirith, the value and worth of, of Numenor at its height. He seems to apprehend that value and worth, the coming of Elendil and, and his followers uh, into Middle-earth. He seems to recognize their great virtue at the time, their great goodness at the time, while also recognizing that they were foiled by arrogance, by the desire for immortality, by the desire for things which are not the lot of man in the bounds of Middle-earth. They wanted to exceed their place among, among the things of Arda, among the creations of Arda, right? But he also recognizes the falling, and that falling itself is difficult. And, of course, when we're talking about hope in this context, we're reminded of the words of Gandalf, that, that, that despair is what happens when hope is extinguished, but Faramir does not seem to be following quite in the footsteps, philosophically speaking, of his Mithrandir. He seems to be following instead a path of duty and of honor. We have no hope. What hope have we, said Faramir? It is long since we had any the sword of Elendil, if it returns indeed, may rekindle it, but I do not think it will do more than put off the evil day unless other help unlooked for also comes from elves or men. Okay, so the king might return, you say, this little rhyme that sent Boromir north to Rivendell? Great, great. The heir of Elendil may return, may may return to the throne of Minas Tirith, may, may lead our people again in the conflict against the Shadow, but even that... It's probably not going to be enough, for the enemy increases and we decrease. We are a failing people, a springless autumn. We are in decline now. And you'll note that Faramir here is not talking more generally. He's not talking more broadly than, than he means here. He is not talking about the decline of men, which is, of course, such a, such a common feature of Tolkien storytelling here. He's not talking about the fact that men as elves and hobbits will too, dwarves as well, that, that the races of Middle-earth will diminish, that we will move into a less magical age. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking specifically about the war. For the enemy increases and we decrease. We are a failing people, a springless autumn. And then he pivots. The men of Numenor were settled far and wide on the shores and seaward regions of the Great Lands, but for the most part they fell into evils and follies. The men of Numenor came to Middle-earth and they settled in the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom and all along the shore, and most of them have fallen. Most of them have fallen either to evils and follies, right? Many became enamored of the darkness and the black arts. So some were actually corrupted. Some fell into the shadow themselves. Some were given over wholly to idleness and ease an equal kind of, of corruption, though of a very different kind, and some fought among themselves until they were conquered in their weakness by the wild men. Some fought among themselves. There, this perspective on Gondorian fealty, which is particularly important because, of course, we must remember what it is that Faramir is doing here. Faramir, like Aomer before him, when Aomer meets with Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas on the plains of, of Rohan, he hands over the horses and says, okay, but you've got to come to Edoras. You have to come and present yourself at the Golden Hall of Methuselt to the king or I'm in trouble, like this is going to go badly for me. And indeed, when we get to Edoras, when we get to Methuselt, we find Eomer in prison. He has been detained, partly on the instructions of Grima Wormtongue, of course, who wants to remove an opponent to his domination of the court of Theoden King, but partly also because of his interaction with Aragorn, partly because he has betrayed his duty. There isn't that kind of conflict here for Eomer. He's not saying, Frodo, you have to do good things or I'm in real trouble. Faramir has already, in a sense, violated his oath. He has already betrayed his king, allowing Frodo and Sam to live and, as we'll see in the pages to come, reuniting them with Gollum and sending them on their way with the One Ring into Mordor. This is treason. He is absolutely betraying his king. And as he says, he believes that there's a decent chance, at least, that his life will be forfeit for it. He is betraying exactly the bond of loyalty that has held Gondor together as the other kingdoms of man have fallen, as they have turned to wreck and ruin, fallen to idleness and ease. Well, there's no idleness and ease among the men of Gondor, at least not these men of Gondor specifically. And some fought among themselves until they were conquered in their weakness by the wild man. He is betraying his 
his duty here in allowing Frodo and Sam to live. And he's recognizing the evilness of that, the darkness of that, the danger of that, at least. But he's doing so in the name of greater virtue. And that will, of course, allow the light to remain, allow the light to endure. It is not said that evil arts were ever practiced in Gondor or that the Nameless One was ever named in honor there. Okay, Gondor is different. These other kingdoms have fallen. Some have been corrupted by darkness. Some have fallen to idleness. Some have fallen to, to, to civil war and civil strife and civil conflict, but not in Gondor. It is not said that evil arts were ever practiced in Gondor or that the Nameless One was ever named in honor there. And the old wisdom and beauty brought out of the West remained long in the realm of the sons of Elendil the Fair, and they linger there still. Like Boromir, Faramir believes that Gondor is still a bastion against the darkness, that it is still the greatest hope of Middle-earth in thwarting the shadow, though for all that it is the greatest hope, there is not much hope. There is, as far as Faramir can see, no hope. It is long since we had any hope. He says, this isn't just a new occurrence. Hey, you know what? It's not just that the shadow has risen again. It's not just that there are orcs now pouring out of the mountains of Mordor and the mountains of, of the Misty, you know, the mountains of the Misty Mountains, out of the Misty Mountains too, like ants boiling out of, of ant colonies. No, it's not new. We haven't had any hope for the longest time. We are still, though, continuing the long fight, the long defeat, as Galadriel would have it. Yet even so, it was yet even so it was Gondor that brought about its own decay, falling by degrees into dotage, and thinking that the enemy was asleep, who was only banished, not destroyed. And that last phrase has always stood out to me as a particularly a particularly interesting one, right? Thinking that the enemy was asleep, who was only banished, not destroyed. But you thought the enemy was asleep, not destroyed, right? The enemy was not vanquished outright for all of our celebrations following the, the Battle of the Last Alliance, for all of our celebrations at the end of the Second Age and the, the, the taking up of the ring, albeit in secret, by Isildur, for all of our celebrations there, it seems as though the men of Gondor didn't really believe that evil had been permanently vanquished. And of course, they have faced the coming of the evil shadow in the many years since, in the 3,000 years since that Battle of the Last Alliance. Of course, Minas Ithil has, has fallen, you know, and turned to Minas Morgul. Osgiliath has been taken and corrupted and all but destroyed. It is now a battlefield between the two towers which flank it on the west and the east. The men of Gondor have endured without hope now for a long, long while. But it is not hope that gives them cause. It is not hope that keeps them fighting this good fight. It is duty, and it is loyalty, and it is, in its way, love. It is a chivalric love of life and of virtue. You know, they're preserving their light and their kingdom. Um, let me see in the chat here. Um, oh, Joseph says, although it's not allegory, the Gondor Rome metaphors just seem endless to me. That's not um, inappropriate, actually. And again, yes, not allegory, right? Tolkien is not talking about Rome, but there is certainly applicability to the fall of the Western Roman Empire in particular. And in its way, <sighs> <laughs> in its way, a kind of allegory, a kind of uh, applicable resonance there with the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire too, in that the first was conquered from without, but the second was conquered from within. Conquered is, is too heavy-handed a word when you're talking about the Byzantine Empire, when you're talking about the Eastern Roman Empire. It, it fell to modernity, in a sense. The Eastern Roman Empire diminished in much the same way as the men of the West are now going to diminish, moving into the Fourth Age. Yeah, that's that's a really good observation there. Um, as Angela's calling out here, evil arts is different from dark arts, or so we discussed in Dear Mr. Potter, dark arts may be tools used for evil. Um, I think that there's a stark distinction there between the works of J.K. Rowling and, and uh, the works of Professor Tolkien in that in the works of Tolkien, darkness is always evil, right? Darkness and evil are, are synonyms for one another. The shadow and evil are synonyms for one another. The darkness, evil, corruption, these things are coexistent and, and necessarily require the spawning of the others, right? Where there is evil, there will be corruption and darkness. And where there is darkness, there will be evil and corruption. And, and that cycle just continues. That is distinct from the less focused and and less complete kind of worldview that we get from from jk rowling in the harry potter series but yes absolutely or the british empire a variant of Kant calling out another uh, example there absolutely and an example which would have been i think an example which would have been even more uh on tolkien's mind as he was writing this particularly of course coming out of the first world war and and coming through the second world war i don't think that that's an inappropriate bit of applicability right again 
not an allegory. Tolkien is not telling a story about the Second World War. He is not telling a story about the First World War. But there is, of course, resonance. We talked about this most recently, I suppose, when we were talking about the Dead Marshes and, and the experience that Tolkien had personally at the Battle of the Somme and seeing not just the devastation of war, but the aftermath of war. What, what terrible war on, on the grandest possible scale can do to the natural world and can do to the landscape. And those men who have fallen forgotten in the trenches of either the Battle of the Last Alliance on the Plains of Dagorlad or the Battle of the Somme, which uh, Tolkien witnessed himself, of course. Um, let me see here. Uh, yes, we're also getting some speculation here from Nikki. Uh, Nikki's addressing the the issue of the orcs. Actually, toward the end of the book, it stated that some of the orcs just wanted to go home and were only here because they had to be. Yeah, we're going to have the opportunity to talk extensively about orcs as we move into the return of the king and to really develop our understanding of orcs. We have had fragments of, of orcish culture in, in the frame of this book, and we're going to get a much more developed perspective. Really, the orcs that we've seen to this point within the frame of the Lord of the Rings, obviously we get the goblins in The Hobbit, which are slightly different, but slightly different culturally, I suppose. By the time we get into The Return of the King, we're really going to be able to look at the conflict between regular orcs, run-of-the-mill orcs, and the Urukai, the fighting Urukai. We're going to be able to delve into that a little more. Oh, orchestry, says Joseph. Yes, yes, exactly right. Good. Good. Um, Seastar says, the darkness shadow equals evil thing makes the latter reference to the beloved shadows of the Shire in Sam's mind stand out for me. We're going to talk about Sam's dream before we wrap up today. Yes. And Pete says, I think the idleness and ease trap can be applied to hobbits. They're good and comfortable, but perhaps too comfortable and unprepared for the evil that may one day reach them. Yes. Um, in part, in part, there is a wholesomeness to ease and to comfort, right? This is represented throughout the books. Everywhere we turn, we are given a perspective on, on ease and on comfort. And even here in Ithilien, right? One of the things that restores courage to Frodo's heart is the relative comfort of their surroundings here in Ithilien. It is still a good land that has been uncorrupted. But we must remember when we're talking about the the civility of the Shire, this 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 almost um, idyllic perspective on life in the Shire, that the Shire is protected. The reason that life in the Shire is progressing unmolested throughout, you know, the last century or more is that the Rangers of the Dunedain are protecting the Shire actively, along with Gandalf too, of course. So, yes, there is an argument there, but also... Uh, that, that does little, I think, to undermine the actual virtue of comfort and of goodness, right? We're reminded of, of Thorin's words at the end of, of The Hobbit when he's talking to Bilba, the child of the kindly West. If more of us valued this kind of comfort, to roughly paraphrase Thorin there, but, but in the broader sense, if the peoples of Middle-earth valued comfort more than conquest, then we'd be okay. We'd actually be just fine. And I think that there is here a sense in which Gondor has been protected. Gondor still stands because of its fealty, because of its loyalty, because of its ferocity in the battle against the Shadow, because it is strict and stringent in that regard. But that very strictness, that, that definition of Gondorian culture has led to its own downfall. It has fallen by degrees into dotage, thinking the enemy was asleep who was only banished, not destroyed. We have been vigilant, yes, but we've kind of been performatively vigilant. We haven't actually stood as we should have stood. We haven't actually represented virtue in the way that we Gondorians ought to have represented virtue because we have been lulled into complacency. We have become lulled by stories of our own greatness and grandeur, right? So we end up with this line from Boromir, with this perspective from Boromir, this, this you know, Alexander Hamilton kind of perspective from Boromir that, hey, what if there was a war though? What if there was a war where we could prove our worth, where we could demonstrate our mettle? Boromir's whole fantasy of using the ring and becoming a great general, becoming a great king, that speaks to Boromir's underlying desire for conflict. He wants there to be a fight. Faramir does not. Faramir more perfectly represents the virtues of the Numenorean line that have come into Gondor but have faltered. In Gondor, the, the fighting of the fight, the, like, the glory and the grandeur of, of warriors in combat, has eclipsed the quieter and softer virtues of the Numenorean life. The Numenoreans did not come into Middle-earth to fight. That was not what Elendil was doing. He wasn't leading an army to the shores of Middle-earth. He was leading his people to the shores of Middle-earth. They were the survivors of Arpharazon's ruinous campaign against Valinor, right? That, that's why we fled from, from ruined, sunken Numenor. That's why Elendil came into Middle-earth in the first place. It was a rejection of war rather than the, the taking up of the reins of war once more.
Joseph asks, to what extent are we meant to see the decline of Gondor as a failing versus an inevitability given the nature of man? Well, I think that in some ex to some extent, we are supposed to see that resonance there, right? We are supposed to understand, even at this point in the text, even without looking at the extra textual sources surrounding the Lord of the Rings, we have a sense that that time is passing. We've had this perspective from Gandalf, we've had this perspective from Elrond, we've had a kind of perspective from, from Aragorn on this basis too, right? A, a sense that that whatever happens next, it will not be what is what has happened before, right? We we cannot truly and authentically restore the glory of the vanished elder days. We can build something new, but it won't be what was. And in that sense, we are still diminishing. We're, we're aware of that. We're conscious of that in the narrative of the Lord of the Rings, even at this point. But the faltering of Gondor is like the faltering of other men, right? The Dúnedain have held strong, but in refusing to lead the the uh, refusing to lead is of course somewhat problematic too because they don't have a people left to lead they are the shattered remnant of the northern kingdom of arnor but the dunedain have not rebuilt in the way that they ought perhaps to have rebuilt in the way that the numenorians would have rebuilt back in the day the gondorians have atrophied the rohirrim have have atrophied in a way in that they have shattered themselves they have splintered themselves off from their northern kin the rohirrim are are an excellent kind of perspective on, on colonists, in a sense. The Rohirrim came south and kind of co-opted Gondorian culture a little bit and synthesized Gondorian culture with their own native culture. But now, as we know from our discussions with the Rohirrim, they no longer speak the same language as they did back in the north. But they're also not quite a part of Gondor either. They are a free and independent peoples here in the middle of, uh, in the middle of Middle Earth, but they're not building. They're still not progressing. That may change, ultimately. But yes, yes. Um, <laughs> 20 minutes on one slide. Okay, here, let's keep pushing on. You're absolutely right. Yes, calling that out, Shane. Thank you for that. Here we go. Let's get a brief taxonomy of man here. This gives a, this actually speaks to your question, Joseph, and how we look at the, the passing of the greatness of man here in Middle-earth. For so we reckon man in our lore, calling them the high or man of the west, which were Numenorians, and the middle peoples, men of the twilight, such as are the Rohirrim and their kin that still dwell far in the north, and the wild, the man of darkness. Yet now, if the Rohirrim are grown in some ways more like to us, enhanced in arts and gentleness, we too have become more like to them, and can scarce claim any longer the title High. We are become middle man of the twilight, but with memory of other things. For as the Rohirrim do, we now love war and valor as things good in themselves, both a sport and an end. And though we still hold that a warrior should have more skills and knowledge than only the craft of weapons and slaying, we esteem a warrior nonetheless above men of other crafts. Such is the need of our days. So even was my brother Boromir a man of prowess, and for that he was accounted the best man in Gondor. And very valiant indeed he was. No heir of Minas Tirith for long years has been so hardy in toil, so onward into battle, or blown a mightier note on the great horn. Faramir sighed and fell silent for a while. So here we have the actual recognition of the diminishment of man in Middle-earth, right? For a time, we were high. We were the men of the West. We were the Numenorians. And then the Middle Peoples, men of the twilight, such as, such as are the Rohirrim and their kin that dwell still far in the North, and the Wild, the men of darkness, right? So the Wild Men are those who have already fallen. Those are the ones that are already lost, who fell to... To, to internal conflict, who fell to darkness outright, who, who began worshipping the Nameless One, who began honoring the Nameless One and, and succumbed willingly to the darkness, or those who fell into idleness and, and stopped the, the pursuit of virtue and valor in that sense. And he draws the perfect comparison here, right? The Rohirrim came into the south. These middlemen came into the south and they set up their, their brand new kingdom five centuries ago uh, to the north of Gondor in that in that empty land, which we, we ceded to them after their aid in the great wars against the orcs. They came here and they have picked up some Gondorian traits. They have, they have elevated themselves, enhanced in arts and gentleness. In gentleness here, he means like courtly civility. That's, that's one of the virtues to which Faramir is laying claim on behalf of Gondor in general. That's one of the virtues to which Faramir is laying claim here. But we have fallen. We have been diminished too for as the Rohirrim do we now love war and valor as good th as things good in themselves both a sport and an end this is our 
purpose, but this is also our pastime. This is our celebration. We are joyous now in the pursuit of war in a way that we never were before. Remember, the Numenorean survivors who fled to Middle-earth are those Numenorians who did not side with our Pharazon and his calamitous assault upon Valinor, his, his, his egocentric, arrogant assault upon Valinor, right? Led by the influence of Sauron too, of course. Though we, though we still hold that a warrior should have more skills and knowledge than only the craft of weapons and slaying, we esteem a warrior nonetheless above men of other crafts. And here we're getting the reflection on the slide that we spent so long on last week. I do not love the sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness. Faramir here is separating himself. I am not the perfect Gondorian warrior, right? There is a, an element of kind of Aristotelian virtue ethics to our discussion of Gondor. Gondor's priorities have shifted. They have moved. They are now less about arts and gentleness as, one, uh, as once they were, and more now about, about war and conflict. And within that frame, Boromir is the best man of Gondor. He was accounted the best man of Gondor and very valiant indeed he was. No heir of Minas Tirith for long years has been so hardy in toil, so onward into battle or blown a mightier note on the great horn. By the standards of Gondor, Boromir was the guy. He was the best. But that's not always what Gondor was. Faramir here recognizing that Gondor has slipped, explaining exactly how, in fact, Gondor has slipped. And in so doing, by extending gentleness to Frodo and Sam, by extending his own wisdom, by not falling into the trap of, of blindly obeying his instructions, by being a better steward of Gondor, in fact, than either his, his father or his brother, Faramir is displaying Numenorean virtue. He is displaying the kind of virtues that elevated the men of the West, the high man. I think it's, it's yes, uh, this is what we're, we're calling out to here. Um, Andrea says he loves not the sword, but what it defends, yet the society loves war. Exactly. And here is Mbar, uh, that's Andrea saying that in the, in the Crowdcast chat here. And here is Mbarz confirms, I think that's the point. Faramir is different because he doesn't love war like his people did. Andrea says, do you think the hypermasculinity of war is just a manifestation of strength, feeling secure and safe? Gosh, that's really interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, okay. The much broader point here is that within the world of Tolkien, strengths are always moderate. They are always mediated. It was not the case that, that the Numenorians were incapable of war or disinterested in war. They were great warriors. Elendil the Tall was a fantastic warrior, right? When he came into Middle-earth, he led a, a conquest, a military conquest. Of course, they united at the Battle of the Last Alliance to cast down the, the, the unnamed evil, right? They, they, they took this role and did so willingly, but like Faramir, not in the pursuit of war itself. It was balanced. That, that desire for that desire for war, that skill at war and warfare was balanced by gentleness and by art and by softer virtue. It was balanced by wisdom. Wisdom has faltered. Lore has waned in Gondor, seems to be what we're, we're pointing toward here. But yes, I think that the, um, yeah, uh, uh, Nikki says, the text did say the Numenorean blood ran strong in Faramir. His actions speak the truth of this. Absolutely true. Remember, uh, Frodo recognizes this immediately. He sees the Numenorean blood in Faramir, even among the other men that Faramir leads and commands, which seem to be, who seem to be, good men. This is the last outpost of Numenorean virtue, arguably, in, in the South, at least, of course, Aragorn is, is a whole different thing here, yeah. Um, as for the hypermasculinity of war, Andrea, um, there is something to that. There is something to that. Um, I think I mentioned this last time, but Professor Tolkien was talking about um, talking about the connection between himself and Faramir and how aligned he was with Faramir, with particular reference to that, that, that not loving the mechanics of war or the execution of war or the glory of war, but loving what those things protect, what those things preserve. And he was talking in the context of the Second World War about how much, though he hates war, though he hated war, getting mixed up in my, my tenses here, though he hated war, he would have taken up arms to preserve England in the hope that tomorrow would be better than today, in the hope that he could vanquish an evil or preserve a good that would endure. The hypermasculinity of war, which is a very powerful turn of phrase, Andrea, and, and not, an, an, not an inaccurate turn of phrase there, I think, is, is what happens when we begin to confuse the purpose of war for the practice of war, which is what has happened with the Rahirim and what has happened here now in Gondor too. Yeah. Yeah. It all, of course, comes back to hope as Heroes and Bards observes. Yes. Very good. Okay. So let's... Uh, Let's step away from the ruin of Gondor and instead talk a little about elves. It's time for Sam to give us another chapter in his ongoing book, Elves, Sir. 
You don't say much in your tales about the elves, sir, said Sam, suddenly plucking up courage. He had noted that Faramir seemed to refer to elves with reverence, and this, even more than his courtesy and his food and wine, had won Sam's respect and quieted his suspicions. No, indeed, Master Samwise, said Faramir, for I am not learned in elven lore. But there you touch upon another point in which we have changed, declining from Numenor to Middle-earth. For as you may know, if Mithrandir was your companion and you had spoken with Elrond, the Edain, the fathers of the Numenorians, fought beside the elves in the first wars and were rewarded by the gift of the kingdom in the midst of the sea within sight of Elvenholm. But in Middle-earth, men and elves became estranged in days of darkness by the arts of the enemy and by the slow changes of time in which each kind walked further down their sundered roads. Men now fear and misdoubt the elves, and yet know little of them. And we of Gondor grow like other men, like the men of Rohan, for even they who are foes of the Dark Lord shun the elves and speak of the Golden Wood with dread. Yet there are among us still some who have dealings with the elves when they may, and ever and anon one will go in secret to Lorien, seldom to return. Not I, for I deem it perilous now for mortal men willfully to seek out the elder people, yet I envy that you have spoken with the White Lady. The Lady of Lorien, Galadriel, cried Sam. You should see her, indeed you should, sir. I am only a hobbit, and gardening's my job at home, sir, if you understand me, and I'm not much good at poetry, not at making it, a bit of comic growing perhaps now and again, you know, but not real poetry, so I can't tell you what I mean. It ought to be sung. You'd have to get Stroider, Aragorn, that is, or old Mr. Bilbo for that. But I wish I could make a song about her. Beautiful she is, sir, lovely, sometimes like a great tree in flower, sometimes like a white, a white daffodown lily, a daffodown dilly, excuse me, small and slender-like, hard as diamonds, soft as moonlight, warm as sunlight, cold as frost in the stars, proud and far off as a snow mountain, and as merry as any lass I ever saw with daisies in her hair in springtime. But that's a lot of nonsense and all white of my mark. And she must be lovely indeed, said Faramir, perilously fair. I don't know about perilous, said Sam. It strikes me that folks take their peril with them in DeLorean and finds it there because they've brought it. But perhaps you could call her perilous because she's so strong in herself, like you could dash yourself to pieces on her like a ship on a rock or drown yourself like a hobbit in a river. But neither rock nor river would be to blame. Now borrow... He stopped and went red in the face. A sea star saying here in the crowdcast chat, please, Sam, you're great at poetry. Your troll ballad was awesome and intricate. And when I made a version of it about Bilbo and Gollum, it took me far longer to compose. Fair, fair. He's still very good. And Becca observing fan, uh, Sam fanboying over Galadriel is still the best. It is wondrous that Sam has carried with him this image of Lothlorien. And it is an image which we might question in fairness, right? The peril of Lothlorien, Sam asserts, is the peril that is brought into Lothlorien by those who venture into the Golden Wood. And it's not completely true. Not completely true. Maybe now it is more true than it was just a few weeks ago before Frodo came into Lothlorien and offered Galadriel the ultimate temptation, which she, of course, resisted and passed, acknowledging even in the doing so that it would lead to her diminishment, that it would lead to the passing of this wonder from the world. But Lothlorien was not safe. It was not wholesome entirely for all of its appearance of wholesomeness, right? You'll recall our long discussions about Lothlorien and the fact, Lothlorien and the fact that no stain lay upon the wood of Lorien because it was preserved, because Galadriel was, was enforcing a kind of, of static perfection upon Lothlorien. And of course, here too, Faramir is, is speaking directly to the lore of fairy in the real world. This is what happens to mortals who go into, into the realm of fairy. Very few of them ever return. Many of them are enchanted. Many of them are struck with the wonder of fairy and voluntarily go out in pursuit of elves, but very few of them return. And those that do almost never return unchanged. They are altered by their experience. And one of the media by which that, that change is wrought, one of the, the means by which elves transform mortals who venture into fairy is through beauty itself. To leave behind the mortal world and go into the immortal world and be confronted with incalculable beauty, the kind of beauty that would contort a hobbit's words into intricate knots, for example, the kind of beauty which would falter even as you try to express it in the most poetic terms, that leaves you changed. It has changed Sam. Sam has been changed by the perilous beauty of the Lady Galadriel and her realm. Though we must, of course, take just a moment, even as, even as I'm, I'm glancing sidelong at the clock here, we must take a moment to look at Sam's poetry because it is just beautiful. Firstly, of course, I'm not much good at poetry, not at making it, a bit of comic rhyme perhaps now and again, you know, but not real poetry. So I can't tell you what I mean. It ought to be sung. You'd have to get Strider, Aragorn that is, or old Mr. Bilbo for that. 
Sam skillfully recognizing the superior poetic ability of these men with whom he has traveled. But I wish I could make a song about her. Beautiful she is, sir. Lovely. Sometimes like a great tree in flower. Sometimes like a white daffodown dilly. Daffodown dilly there, the, uh, the, the rustic, uh, rusticism. Uh, rusticism. I'm not quite sure how you put the stress on the seed there, whether that's a hard or a soft seed. But uh, an old style rustic term for the daffodil, of course. Um, sometimes like a great tree in flower. Sometimes like a white daffodown dilly, small and slender like sometimes immense, sometimes tiny, slender, not fragile, for even the daffodil is empowered with the strength of the growing thing, but certainly more fragile than the great tree in flower. She is of opposition, right? This is what Sam is, is really leaning into in his, descri his description of Galadriel here. He is seeking to encompass her by describing the, the full scope of her variety, the scope of her complexity, the scope of her enormity here. Sometimes like a great tree in flower, sometimes like a single daffodil. Hard as diamonds, but soft as moonlight. Both here, silver. Both shining, we might be called upon to imagine here, with that Tolkienian pale light, right? That pale light that is so often associated with things that are magical, things that are virtuous here. Hard as diamonds, soft as moonlight. Warm as sunlight, cold as frost in the stars. Sam has absolutely modulated here into the elven meter, right? He's describing things in elven terms here. It's all stars and moonlight and sun, right? This is this is the 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 register in which we ought perhaps to speak of elves. Warm as sunlight, cold as frost in the stars, proud and far off as a snow mountain, as unknowable, as distant, as immense and incalculable as 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 any of the mountains in the misty mountains, right? But also as merry as any lass I ever saw with daisies in her hair in springtime. But that's a load of nonsense and all wide of my mark. I'm not, Sam confirms here at the end, saying what I mean. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm spilling forth the most poetic language that I have to offer. Like, I'm doing the best that I can. I'm expanding my poetic talent to the very limits of my ability. But all of that, all of that is, is failing to encapsulate the wonder of Galadriel. And Faramir seems to recognize this. Then she must be lovely indeed, says Faramir, perilously fair. I don't know about perilous, said Sam. He doesn't see he doesn't see the change that has been wrought within him. And the change that is wrought within the mortal heart by the transition through fairy, by, by time spent in fairy, by exposure to fairy, or in some stories, not so much in this story, but in some stories, the intrusion of fairy into the mortal world, the change that is wrought is wrought by the excess of goodness, right? Elves are terrifying because they are so, so beyond mortal comprehension. They are more beautiful, more grand, more elegant, more magical, more wise than mortals are. And that leaves you transformed. Sam here proving, proving Faramir's point, I think, quite specifically, that he himself has been transformed. He would not be thinking in, the, in these terms, even back in the Shire, right? Even early elf Sir Sam would not have been able to offer this perspective on what Elves in general are, and what the Lady Galadriel specifically is. Yes, very old and very young, says Becca Eller. Elves are hard to describe, you all, because they are all of these things, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Oxymorons galore, observes Varieg of Kant. Yes, good, good. Um, Shane is asking, do folktales come from fairy because the animals entered into fairy and are also changed? Talking bit oh, the Crowdcast chat scrolled and I lost the, the back half of that. Talking bears and foxes, etc. or does, does this get us too close to the Hobbit's tone? Um... No, no. The uh, the attribution to animals of a kind of um, sapience and self-awareness and even the ability to talk is, in terms of the history of folklore, distinct from fairy stories, right? Fairy as another realm is... I suppose there is crossover in that in fairy, you are likely to find talking animals. You are less likely to find talking animals than you are to find fairies, elves in the Tolkienian tradition, but you are likely to find talking animals there just because of the the background kind of magic, right? This is something that C.S. Lewis pulls out in Narnia, of course. That That's absolutely true of, of fairy. And the degree to which Narnia is, the degree to which Narnia is fairy is fascinating and somewhat inconsistently represented through even the line, the witch in the wardrobe, right? Never mind the, the other books in that series, but that is a common feature of folklore. It is not, it does not imply or demand a coexistence between talking animals and, and fairy specifically capital F fairy tales, right? There is a, those are two independent traditions in folklore, though, of course, because of the way that the oral tradition worked, even up to you know the 17th and 18th centuries, because of the way that these stories were told, there was a huge amount of crossover, a huge amount of, of cross-pollination there. Yeah, good. Um, let me see as I catch up. 
Oh, Heroes and Bards is taking off. Good night, Heroes and Bards. Thank you for joining us for the first half of today's session. Uh, a pleasure to have you as always. Um, good. Okay, let's uh, let's keep moving onward. Then that's I, I just had to pull, of course, Sam. In fact, our next three slides, including this one, are going to be conversations between Sam and Faramir. We're going to get the development of a relationship between two people who are defined as, uh, defined by their role as good and honorable servants, right? Let's uh, take a look at the next slide here. As Sam steps up to defend his master and to, uh, to, um, <laughs> to oppose Faramir, right? This is not the first time that he's done this. I've kind of playfully entitled this. We previously had the slide where, uh, where we're holding court and Faramir is interrogating Frodo. And you'll remember that Sam is sitting off on the, the, the flank uh, among the ring of Faramir's men, just kind of watching this unfold until he can, can contain himself no longer and has to interpose himself in the defense of his master. And I had playfully entitled that slide, Sam Steps Up. So this slide, I suppose we can entitle Sam Steps Up to the Streets. That's a perfectly serviceable title for a sequel, I suppose. Now look here, sir. He turned, faced Faramir with all the courage he could muster. Don't you go taking advantage of my master because his servant's no better than a fool. You've spoken very handsome all along, put me off my guard, talking of elves and all. But handsome is as handsome does, we say. Now's a chance to show your quality. So it seems, said Faramir, slowly and very softly with a strange smile. So that is the answer to all the riddles. The one ring that was thought to have perished from the world. And Boromir tried to take it by force, and you escaped and ran all the way to me. And here in the wild, I have you. Two halflings and a host of men at my call and the ring of rings. A pretty stroke of fortune. A chance for Faramir, captain of Gondor, to show his quality? Ha! He stood up, very tall and stern, his gray eyes glinting. Frodo and Sam sprang from their stools and set themselves side by side with their backs to the wall, fumbling for their sword hilts. There was a silence. All the men in the cave stopped talking and looked toward them in wonder. But Faramir sat down again in his chair and began to laugh quietly and then suddenly became grave again. Alas for Boromir. It was too sore a trial, he said. How you have increased my sorrow, you two strange war wanderers from a far country, bearing the peril of men. But you are less judges of men than I of halflings. We are truth speakers, we men of Gondor. We boast seldom and then perform or die in the attempt. Not if I had found it on the highway would I take it, I said. Even if I were such a man as to desire this thing, and even though I know not clearly what the thing, what the thing was when I spoke... Still, I should take those words as a vow and be held by them. But I am not such a man. Or I am wise enough to know that there are some perils from which a man must flee. Sit at peace and be comforted, Samwise. If you seem to have stumbled, think it was fated to be so. Your heart is shrewd as well as faithful and so clearer than your eyes. For strange though it may seem, it was safe to declare this to me. It may even help the master that you love. It shall turn to his good if it is in my power. So be comforted. But do not name this thing again aloud. Once is enough. Here we get the reveal. And we do so in, we explore the consequence of that reveal in a beautiful way that ties back to two previous con uh, confrontations, both of which have resonance here in our ongoing discussions with Faramir. The first, of course, is with Galadriel, she who was so recently named, because Faramir gives us a version of Galadriel's speech, right? And here in the wild I have you, two halflings and a host of men at my call, and the ring of rings, a pretty stroke of fortune, a chance for Faramir, captain of Gondor, to show his quality. This echoes Galadriel's words to Frodo back in Lothlorien. I could take it from you. You could surrender it to me. Here we are, you and I, alone. No one would know. No one would question. No one would doubt that I had done the right thing, taking the ring from you. But that's not who I am. That's not the choice that I am making. I am passing the test. And so Faramir here too passes the test. And we also get the echo of that aforementioned scene with Eomer and Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas out on the plains of Rohan. We are truth speakers, we men of Gondor, asserts Faramir, which is very close to what Eomer said too, right? That they tell the truth and so are not easily deceived. That seems to be the same, or at least a similar connection between these two groups of men. We are truth speakers, we men of Gondor. We boast seldom and then perform or die in the attempt. We do not make great claims in Gondor, but if we do make great claims, then we will take action. We will fulfill those great claims or we will die in the attempt. We take our word, we take our oaths very seriously. Not if I found it on the highway would I take it, I said. Even if I were such a man as to desire this thing. Even if I wanted it first. And even if I didn't know what it was when I made that rash claim, when I, when I said that I wouldn't pick it up if I found it by the highway, even if both of those things are true, still I would take those words as a vow and be held by them. 
even if I were any other man of Gondor, even if I were at least a great man of Gondor, I would take the words that I spoke to you previously as a vow. I would take them as an oath and I would not now claim the ring. But I am not such a man. Or I am wise enough to know that there are some perils from which a man must flee. Even if I wanted the ring, I wouldn't take it. But I don't want it. I'm wise enough to know that this is too great a peril for the likes of me. Sit at peace and be comforted, Samwise. If you seem to have stumbled, think it was fated to be so. Think, by the way, that this is chance of chance you call it, Sam. Think, don't blame yourself for slipping up here. Yes, okay. You made a mistake and revealed to me that your master was holding the one ring. Okay, that could have turned out very badly. But actually, it is going to, as is the way of things here in Middle Earth, it's going to turn to good purpose. It's going to turn to a positive outcome because I am not the kind of man who would claim the ring anyway. Your heart is shrewd as well as faithful and saw clearer than your eyes. Attributing this to Sam, by the way, you'll note, not attributing it to, to, well, you know, in this world, we sometimes have you catastrophes and sometimes you really screw up, but then it turns out pretty good. It turns out okay in the end. No, he's crediting Sam. Great insight here. Your heart is shrewd as well as faithful and saw clearer than your eyes. You knew that this would be okay, which is why subconsciously, Sam, you did this thing. For strange though it may seem, it was safe to declare this to me. It may even help the master that you love. It shall turn to his good if it is in my power. So be comforted. But do not even name this thing again aloud. Once is enough. Like, okay, I get. You slipped up. It's going to be okay. It's actually going to be great that you've revealed the truth to me inadvertently. But don't go saying the name of the One Ring anymore. Like, like, don't, don't do that anymore because, okay, it's worked out well this time, but it might not work out so well the next time. Not for me, but, you know, there are 300 men surrounding us right now. So this is the test. And, of course, I'm, I'm oh, go read the thing Joseph wrote. Here we are. Um, Joseph, <laughs> I'm getting demands here from Becca in the chat to go and read the thing that Joseph wrote. I think this is the thing to which she's referring. So everyone, turn in your one ring tests. Galadriel, Faramir, Aragorn, Gandalf. Well done. Nice work here, Boromir. Can I speak with you after class? Now I wish that I'd read that in the, uh, in the voice of Minerva McGonagall from Hogwarts. Yes. Uh, everyone, turn in your one ring tests. Galadriel, Faramir, Aragorn, Gandalf. Well done. Nice work there, Boromir. Uh, can I speak with you after class? Yes. Uh, 10 has points from Slytherin for Boromir failing the one ring test. Though, of course, Boromir did not fail the one ring test right? Boromir faltered, but in the end was victorious. In the end, he overcame the temptation of the ring. He fell further than any of these other men. And it is interesting to note while we talk about Faramir here, right? Who resists the lure of the ring? Who absolutely resists the lure of the ring? Well, there are very few people, right? Aragorn, yes, technically, yes. Gandalf, yes. Though you'll remember that Gandalf did not want Frodo to offer him the ring. Right? He doesn't want to be tempted by it because he acknowledges that ultimately he probably would falter. Aragorn too, there's a question mark over his relationship with the ring in due course. Faramir, and, and Galadriel of course, believes for the longest time that she would falter, believes for the longest time that she would succumb to the ring and, and exercise her power. It's only in the actual moment of reckoning that she makes the right choice. She had no reason to believe that she would have made that right choice you know, prior to that, that actual confrontation. Faramir is not tempted. Faramir possesses a greater wisdom. Faramir is capable of looking at the ring and seeing it as a danger, as something perilous, more than a great gift, more than a great boon. Though even here, we have to wonder, how much is the ring working on him? Because that second paragraph on your slide here, so it seems, said Faramir, slowly and very softly with a strange smile. So that is the answer to all riddles. The one ring that was thought to have perished from the world. The one ring there, giving it its proper title. And Boromir tried to take it by force and you escaped and ran all the way to me. And here in the wild, I have you. You notice that pivot there where he starts talking about himself, where he's kind of narrating his own experience and he's doing so out loud and he's almost rationalizing his decision here and here in the wild i have you two halflings a host of men at my call the ring of rings a pretty stroke of fortune hey this is just chance look at what chance has given us echoing boromir's words back at parth gallon right back before the falls of rauros a chance for faramir captain of gondor to show his quality here he is elevated giving himself his rank referring to himself in the third person this is the ring this is the ring doing what it does. But Faramir shrugs it off. Frodo and Sam spring, uh, spring from their stools and set themselves side by side with their backs to the wall. Faramir sat down in his chair and began to laugh quietly and suddenly became grave again. The laughter there reminds me of a character that we haven't discussed in the longest time here on There and Back Again, a character who dominated our discussions for, for many weeks back in the pages of The Fellowship of the Ring. But it reminds me of Tom Bombadil. 
Faramir laughs at the ring. He's laughing at himself, of course, too, laughing at this turn of fortune. The ring tries to extend its influence, to my reading at least. The ring tries to extend its influence over Faramir and just can't get purchase. He is too wise. Mm. Yes, there is a wisdom in Faramir, but there is also most crucially a humility in Faramir. What distinguishes Faramir from all the other people that Joseph listed, all the other people who have been challenged by the ring? It is his humility. He doesn't want to conquer. That's why I think it's so significant that we get his title, Faramir, Captain of Gondor, to show his quality, right? This is a chance. The ring is appealing to what it takes to be his arrogance. This worked so well with Boromir, right? This is so good. And if the ring could persuade Faramir to take it, that would be that would be disastrous. That would be as effective, arguably more effective than getting Boromir to take it, right? There's no doubt that Faramir would ultimately fall, but Faramir laughs at the ring and thus the spell is broken. Alas for Boromir, it is too sore a trial, he said. How you have increased my sorrow, you two strange wanderers from a far country bearing the peril of man, but you are less judges of men than I of halflings. This is the ultimate triumph of Faramir. This is Faramir passing the test and going into the West and remaining Galadriel, right? This, this is his moment where he acknowledges, ah, damn it, I can't take it. I wouldn't anyway because of the oath that I took. I would have been bound by that oath, but I'm not going to take it anyway. I don't want it. And that is because of his magnificent, magnificent humility. Yeah. Um, let me see here. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Pete says, I struggle to tell what the Faramir, Faramir is playing, uh, playing with Sam with the I have you speech or whether he really is considering it. To my reading there, yes, absolutely, that is him falling under the influence of the ring. It has all of the cadence and all of the, the, the quirks of perspective and all of the rationalization that we associate with the influence of the ring in other situations, over Boromir, over Galadriel, and now over Faramir too, but Faramir breaks the spell by laughing. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, Angela says that McGonagall gave Boromir a good talking to, uh, and that is why he faltered, resisted, and was redeemed. That's headcanon. I'm into that. Yes. Yes. Though, of course, oh, no, we can't segue out into a discussion of Tom Riddle and uh, and the other things that could have happened at Hogwarts if only Minerva McGonagall had been around to take him in hand and, and offer him, you know, good the, the wizard mom, right? Minerva McGonagall is wizard mom as Gandalf as wizard dad. Can we, can we do that? Which mom? Hmm. I don't know whether we're gendering that based on his, I guess with Gandalf, he is wizard dad. He is a dad who is also a wizard. So therefore Minerva McGonagall would be witch mom, I suppose. That's what we're doing. Okay. Let's, um, Let's uh, push on to our last slide from this chapter. Now that we're almost an hour in and we've only got two more chapters to cover before 3.30, here we go. This is the farewell between Faramir and Sam, or the first stage of the farewell. The, the good night, I suppose, between Faramir and Sam. Well, Frodo, now at last we understand one another, said Faramir. If you took this thing on yourself, unwilling at others asking, then you have pity and honor from me, and I marvel at you to keep it hid and not to use it. You are a new people and a new world to me. Are all your kin of like sort? Your land must be a realm of peace and content, and there must gardeners be in high honor. Not all is well there, said Frodo, but certainly gardeners are honored. But folk must grow weary there, even in their gardens, as do all things under the sun of this world, and you are far from home and way-worn. No more tonight. Sleep, both of you, in peace if you can. Fear not. I do not wish to see it, or touch it, or know more of it than I know which is enough, lest peril perchance way lay me, and I fall lower in the test than Frodo, son of Drogo. Go now to rest. But first tell me only, if you will, whither you wish to go and what to do, for I must watch and wait and think. Time passes. In the morning we must each go swiftly on the ways appointed to us. Frodo had felt himself trembling as the first shock of fear passed. Now a great weariness came on him like a cloud. He could dissemble and resist no longer. I was going to find a way into Mordor, he said faintly. I was going to Gorgoroth. I must find the mountain of fire and cast the thing into the Gulf of Doom. Gandalf said so. I do not think I shall ever get there. Faramir stared at him for a moment in grave astonishment. Then suddenly he caught him as he swayed and lifting him gently, carried him to the bed and laid him there. Excuse me, and covered him warmly. All at once he fell into a deep sleep. Another bed was set beside him for a servant. Sam hesitated for a moment, then bowing very low. Good night, Captain, my lord, he said. You took the chance, sir. Did I so, said Faramir. Yes, sir, and showed your quality, the very highest. Faramir smiled. A pert servant, Master Samwise. But nay, the praise of the praiseworthy is above all rewards. Yet there was not in this to praise. 
I had no lure or desire to do other than I have done. Ah, well, sir, said Sam. You said my master had an elvish air, and that was good and true. But I can say this. You have an air too, sir, that reminds me of, of, well, Gandalf, of wizards. Maybe, said Faramir. Maybe you discern from far away the air of Numenor. Good night. That beat, that moment of connection between Faramir and Sam there is just gorgeous. One of my absolute favorite passages in the entire book. Sam demonstrating where he has been before Pert, where he has been impudent as a servant, where he owes no fealty to Faramir and his his courtesy is mere civility to Faramir, right? Faramir is not his master. Faramir is not his lord. And Faramir actually stands opposed to his master, to his lord. And thus it is Sam's duty to, to stand up to Faramir. But here we get a gesture of real and significant honor. He bows very low. Good night, Captain, my lord, he says, naming his rank and his personal fealty. And then he took the chance, sir. Like that moment of, of impudence, yes, but a kind of, of familiar impudence from Sam, a moment of personal connection there. You took the chance, sir. Did I so, said Faramir. Yes, sir, and showed your quality the very highest. This is high praise indeed from Sam. And Faramir recognizing, nay, the praise of the praiseworthy is above all rewards, yet there was not in this to praise. I had no lure or desire to do other than I have done. I have not passed the test, Sam. I didn't sit the test. And I'm not sure that that's true. I'm not at all sure that that's true. Because, I mean, look at the second paragraph, or the third paragraph, I guess, on the slide. Fear not, I do not wish to see it or touch it or know more of it than I know, which is enough, lest peril perchance waylay me and I fall lower in the test than Frodo, son of Drogo. No, he's recognizing I am susceptible to the temptation of the ring, which is why I don't want to know any more about it or to see it or to lay hand upon it. No, I want to maintain my distance because I am not secure in my ability to pass this test if it is presented to me again. But that humility is what insulates him from the lure of the ring in the first place. And when he speaks untruly but sincerely to Sam here at the end, I had no lure or desire to do other than I have done. That doesn't mean that there is no lure or desire. It doesn't mean that there isn't a force acting upon him in some way to some degree. It just means that right now, he doesn't feel conflicted. Right now, he is secure in the choice that he has made. And then we get this moment of... Utter recognition. You said my master had an elvish air and that was good and true. Note here Sam's humility, that he doesn't reflect a compliment that has been paid to him by Faramir, right? He's not talking about his own worth and value. You said my master had an elvish air and that was good and true, but I can say this. You have an air too, sir, that reminds me of, of well, Gandalf and wizards. Maybe, says Faramir. Just kind of, maybe. I am not of that order, right? I, I am not a wizard. I am not a great man. I am not an influencer of things. I am not even a keeper of lore. Maybe, maybe you discern from far away the air of Numenor. That is the best praise that you can pay to Faramir. Faramir, you are the best of your sort. Faramir, you have not fallen. Faramir, you embody the virtues of the Numenorians who came to Middle-earth and established the kingdom that you so love, the kingdom that you so strive to protect, the kingdom that you would like to see loved as a queen among other queens, not a mistress of slaves, not even a kind mistress of willing slaves. Faramir, you are of Minas Tirith. You are of Gondor. That is what Sam is saying here at the end. Or, or at least that is what Faramir is taking from, from Sam's praise here at the end. Andrea says, Faramir's nobility of strength, humility, and speech just blows me away. I completely agree. Faramir, best of men, the best of men in Middle-earth. It's just, yeah, just stunning. Good. Yeah, Andrea also saying, he had no lure. How could he not have been lured? Yeah, no, I, I read that as, as uh, a kind of, 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 disingenuous humility, uh, slightly disingenuous. He is not feeling the influence of the Lord, but he acknowledges the existence of, of temptation. He acknowledges that knowing more about the ring, getting closer to the ring could lead him to be tempted. And then he's not so sure of his strength, that he would fall lower in the test than Frodo, son of Drogo, right? That he would falter where this halfling has succeeded, where this halfling against all odds has succeeded. And you'll note that there too, he is kind of in implicit opposition with his brother Boromir, that Boromir saw Frodo's burden as, as too great for the halfling to bear. Now Faramir says, no, I could never do what you do. I could never hold the ring. Don't show it to me. Don't name it again, please, because I doubt that I could pass this test again if it were presented to me. But for right now, I feel no lure. I feel no tug upon my heart. I am here to serve and honor you too. 
it's just just fantastic all right now that we have a half hour left let's push into chapter six we're not going to make it through everything let's see if we can make it through chapter six before we wrap up today's session the forbidden pool this uh this pool that is on the borders of of henneth and then right we're kind of resetting now back into the world now that we've had all of these long discussions we've been separated from from frodo's journey to a certain extent now we're being reintegrated into that journey we're going to spend a lot of time dealing with Gollum in in this chapter for a while, Frodo stood there on the high star, I should say, getting into this. This is after Frodo has been awoken in the middle of the night or in the pre-dawn hush, I suppose, and taken by Faramir from his bed to overlook this pool. For a while, Frodo stood there on the high stone and a shiver ran through him, wondering if anywhere in the vastness of the nightlands his old companions walked or slept or lay dead, shrouded in mist. Why was he brought here out of forgetful sleep? Sam was eager for an answer to the same question and could not refrain himself from muttering for his master's ear alone as he thought, it's a fine view, no doubt, Master Frodo, but chilly to the heart, not to mention the bones, what's going on? Faramir heard and answered, Moonset over Gondor. Fair Ithil, as he goes from Middle-earth, glances upon the white locks of old Mindoluin. It is worth a few shivers, but that is not what I brought you to see. Though as for you, Samwise, you were not brought, and do but pay the penalty of your watchfulness. A draught of wine shall amend it. Come, look now. He stepped up beside the silent sentinel on the dark edge, and Frodo followed. Sam hung back. He already felt insecure enough on this high, wet platform. Faramir and Frodo looked down. Far below them, they saw the white waters pour into a foaming bowl and then swirl darkly about a deep oval basin in the rocks, until they found their way out again through a narrow gate and flowed away, fuming and chattering, into calmer and more level reaches. The moonlight still slanted down to the foal's foot and gleamed on the ripples of the basin. Presently, Frodo was aware of a small, dark thing on the near bank— but even as he looked at it, it dived and vanished just below the boil and bubble of the fall, cleaving the black water as neatly as an arrow or an edgewise stone. Gollum, hunting for fishes in the pools, uh, in the depths of the forbidden pool here. One of these uh, innumerable myriad fountains which spring forth from the blessed garden of Athelion, according to Faramir in the last chapter. Fountains there, I think I mentioned this last time, found, the fountains to which Faramir return, uh, refers, the fountains of Athelion, not actual crafted fountains, but but springs and falls and the, you know, the bubbling and running of water, obviously the, the veil that covers Hennethanun being one such fall. Um, so Frodo is woken and, and called out here. Uh, it is worth a few shivers, says Faramir, but that is not what I brought you to see. Though, as for you, Samwise, you were not brought, but do but pay the penalty of your watchfulness. No one summoned you, Sam. You just happened to be awake and looking out for your master. A draft of wine shall amend it. Come look now. Again, again, Sam tagging along where he uh, where he has no means to go. Yes, as Joseph says, Sam, not, not much for asking permission to go places. And Varig of Khan confirms a draft of wine amends many things. And Jackie, hi, Jackie. It's good to see you in the chat. Love the description of the waterfall. Me too. In this chapter and the next, in both the Forbidden Pool and then particularly in Journey to the Crossroads, we get some of the most rich and rewarding descriptions of landscapes that we get in the entire book. And that is entirely purposeful, right? Here we're drawing the distinction of the Garden of Athelion, right? We're, we're, we're looking at at what it is that makes this land preserved, what it is that makes this land so beloved here of the men of Gondor. Then as we leave behind the men of Gondor and, and head on upward toward Kirith Ungol, we get these gorgeous descriptions of the landscape in order to emphasize how far again Frodo is from peace and comfort, how separated he is from even this brief respite here in, in, in Faramir's company, but yes. Um, good, good, all right. Let's, uh, never seen before or, uh, never before or after, says Seastar, uh, no, excuse me, never before or after this scene, it says Seastar, is Gollum spoken of in such complimentary terms? Absolutely fair. Yes. Good. Okay. So that is the, the reveal that Gollum is here once more. And Frodo, of course, takes action. Shall we, sh shall we shoot? Said Faramir, turning quickly to Frodo. Frodo did not answer for a moment. Then, no, he said, no, I beg you not to. If Sam had dared, he would have said yes, quicker and louder. He could not see, but he guessed well enough from their words what they were looking at. You know then what this thing is, said Faramir. Come, now you have seen, tell me why it should be spared. In all our words together, you have not spoken, you have not once spoken of your gangrel companion, and I let him be for the time. He could wait till he was caught and bought before me. I sent my keenest huntsman to seek him, but he slipped them, and they've had no sight of him till now, save Anborn here once at dusk yesterday evening. But now he has done worse trespass than only to go coney snaring in the uplands. He has dared to come to Hennith Anun, and his life is forfeit. I marvel at the creature. So secret and so sly as he is to come sporting in the pool below our very window. Does he think that men sleep without watch all night? Why does he so? There are two answers, I think, said Frodo. For one thing, 
He knows little of men. Sly though he is, your refuge is so hidden that perhaps he does not know that men are concealed here. For another, I think he is allured here by a mastering desire stronger than his caution. He is lured here, you say, said Faramir in a low voice. Can he, does he then know of your burden? Indeed, yes. He bore it himself for many years. He bore it, said Faramir, breathing sharply in wonder. This matter winds itself in ever new riddles. Then he is pursuing it? Maybe. It is precious to him. But I did not speak of that. What then does the creature seek? Fish, said Frodo. Look. Uh, this got me to look up Gangrel, says Seastar, a vagabond, roving beggar, drifter. Yes, I guess that could describe Gollum. Indeed, Varig of Khand observes. I have a few Gangrel, Gangrel companions myself. Yes. Um, Pete says, is the pool forbidden simply because it's part of the Hydat, or does it have some some greater significance to the men of Gondor? Partly because it is it is the um, outer perimeter of Henneth Anun. Yes, and Henneth Anun is a particularly sacred space, right? We've already had brief allusion to that. But this is confirmation. Hey, you came to Hanath Anun, you stranger from a foreign land. That's it. That's death. You don't get a choice in the matter. I don't get a choice in the matter. I, you know, guard captain of Gondor, do not get a choice in this matter. I have to put him to death, says Faramir. Also you and Sam, though, Frodo. Also, I have already kind of hesitated once in the pursuit of my duty. And he's hesitating again, recall, right? Here he says, um, he has dared to come to Hanath Anun and his life is forfeit. But also, should we shoot Frodo? Should we kill him now? Or should we wait? Should we capture him? How should we proceed, Frodo? You who are more learned and wise in this matter. You can, who can guide us better in this matter. Yes. Um, so Frodo goes down and confronts Gollum directly. And we get this confrontation in which Frodo is going to come perilously close to a line that he has up until this point never dared cross Fish, nice fish. White face has vanished, my precious, at last. Yes, now we can eat fish in peace. No, not in peace, precious, for precious is lost. Yes, lost, dirty hobbits, nasty hobbits, gone and left us, Gollum. And precious is gone, only poor Smeagol all alone. No precious, nasty men, they'll take it, steal, my precious. Thieves, we hate them. Fish, nice fish, makes us strong, makes eyes bright, fingers tight. Yes, throttle them, precious. Throttle them all, yes. If we get chances, nice fish, nice fish. So it went on, almost as unceasing as the waterfall, only interrupted by a faint noise of slavering and gurgling. Frodo shivered, listening with pity and disgust. He wished it would stop and that he never need hear that voice again. Anborn was not far behind. He could creep back and ask him to get the huntsman to shoot. They would probably get close enough while Gollum was gorging and off his guard. Only one true shot, and Frodo would be rid of the miserable voice forever. But no, Gollum had a claim on him now. The servant had a claim on the master for service, even service in fear. They would have foundered in the dead marshes, but for Gollum. Frodo knew, too, somehow quite clearly that Gandalf would not have wished it. Smeagol, he said softly. Fish, nice fish, said the voice. Smeagol, he said a little louder. The voice stopped. Smeagol. Master has come to look for you. Master is here. Come, Smeagol. There was no answer but a soft hiss as of intaken breath. Come, Smeagol, said Frodo. We are in danger. Men will kill you if they find you here. Come quickly if you wish to escape death. Come to Master. No, said the voice. Not nice, Master. Leaves poor Smeagol and goes with new friends. Master can wait. Smeagol hasn't finished. There's no time, said Frodo. Frodo, bring fish with you. Come. No, must finish fish. Smeagol, said Frodo desperately. Precious will be angry. I shall take Precious and I shall say, make him swallow the bones and choke. Never taste fish again. Come, Precious is waiting. Here, Frodo getting perilously close, as I said, to that line of using Precious. We've already had the threat, of course. You will obey me. You will take the oath or Precious will compel you. We've also had the direct threat that Frodo could use Precious to uh, use the ring to force uh, force Gollum to leap from a high precipice or leap into fire, just to pick two random examples there. But this is much more specific and much more immediate. Come with me now, or I will use the Precious's hold over you to compel you to choke, to swallow the bones and choke, never taste fish again. What's most interesting here? Um, what's most interesting here, I think, is Frodo's rationalization, his desire to be free of, well, not Gollum, just Gollum, but the voice of Gollum. And here again, we can see this connection between Frodo and Gollum. Frodo is aware he has 
empathy, right? This isn't pity. This is not his his pity for Gollum in that he doesn't share Gollum's fate. He recognizes the burden that has been placed upon Gollum. He recognizes that burden upon his own heart, and he empathizes with Gollum. He wishes the voice would stop, I think, because he wants the silencing of that voice within himself. One true shot, and Frodo would be rid of the miserable voice forever. Not just rid of Gollum's voice, he could also just leave. He could also say to Faramir, actually, don't kill him, but also keep him away from me. I would still be free of his voice. No, but the voice must be silenced. The suffering must stop. But no, Gollum had a claim on him now. The servant had a claim on the master for service, even service in fear. When a servant obeys his master, he is owed an obligation. He is owed a service in return. That is the reciprocal nature of feudalism, you guys. That is what happens for, uh, that is what happens to a good servant. When you perform your duties well as a servant, your master cares for you. And Frodo owes that now to Smeagol, to Gollum, even if his service was compelled, even if it was fear of the ring of the precious that led to that service, that faithful service. They would have foundered in the dead marshes, but for Gollum. So we, we even pull out the specific reference that he's making here. They would have foundered in the dead marshes, but for Gollum. Gollum served us, got us through the dead marshes. And now I owe him for that because I am his master. Frodo knew too, somehow quite clearly that Gandalf would not have wished it. There's still, too, that voice, that echo from the second chapter of the book, that discussion back in Bag End, that Gollum has some greater purpose, that Gandalf believes that Gollum has some greater purpose, right? You'll note that Frodo here is not adopting Gandalf's rationale. He's not adopting Gandalf's, Gandalf's decision-making process here, right? Gandalf, as you recall, has two reasons for preserving Gollum's life. The first, that there is not no hope. There is some small hope that Gollum can be redeemed. Secondly, he has some role to, pay, to play in the unfolding story. Frodo now is so distant from Bag End that he can't borrow Gandalf's reasoning. He can't persuade himself in the way that Gandalf is persuaded, but he can borrow Gandalf's certainty. Frodo knew too somehow quite clearly that Gandalf would not have wished it. And the would not there kind of indicating his belief, of course, his, his knowledge that Gandalf is dead, that Gandalf fell in Khazadum, fell to the Balrog. And there is a sense here in which we are honoring his last wish here, right? Or honoring his memory in some sense. Frodo knew too somehow quite clearly that Gandalf would not have wished it. Not that Gollum has a role to play. Not that, that we should extend pity to the pitiless creature. Not that there is a hope of redemption, but rather that Gandalf wouldn't have wanted it. Yeah. Jackie's saying here in the Crowdcast chat, I think Faramir's greatest fault is the sort of self-doubt he seems to struggle with. Not doubt, but maybe insecurity, being overly humble. Huh. You know, I think there is something to that, Jackie. I think there is something to that. Remember, we had the uh, brief beat in last week's discussion that uh, things would have turned out very differently if Faramir had gone to Rivendell. If he has, had asserted his right as older brother and as the first person to have the prophetic dream to go to Rivendell instead of his younger brother. But Boromir wanted the glory. He wanted the quest. He wanted to prove himself. And so he went to Rivendell, which led to near disaster at Parth Gallon. Would things have turned out differently if Faramir had been there instead? Yes, probably. As I said last time, I don't think that Faramir would have succumbed to that same temptation. But it still seems likely that the Fellowship would have been sundered, that the Fellowship would have parted, that the orcs would still have fallen upon them, and things could have been even more disastrous, right? The reason that Frodo and Sam escaped the orc attack at Parth Gallon is because of the betrayal of Boromir, because of Boromir's uh, succumbing to the temptation of the ring in that brief moment. So Frodo and Sam escape and go on their merry way. If that had happened, if events had played out in exactly the same way, they had gone, out, uh, gone off across the Emin Mool, they had met with, with, with Gollum, they would have coerced his assistance into crossing the Dead Marshes, they would have come to Moran and they would have ventured south into Athelion, and there they would have found Guard Captain Boromir of Gondor. Well, Boromir's response to the ring at that point would have been very different. And the victory of the ring, the victory of the shadow would have been all the more powerful at that point if we just bodily switch Faramir and Boromir at that point. So possibly, arguably, but even then Faramir's humility may arguably be eucatastrophic. It may arguably be the the flaw which allows for the intercession of grace, right? The crack in the world that allows the light to shine through. It may be an imperfect 
it, it may be an imperfection in Faramir's character. It may be an outright flaw in Faramir's character, but could still perhaps be a tool, therefore, of grace, as all the flaws of characters are tools for, for grace. Yeah. Um, yes, very good con points out that Frodo later tells Faramir that Gollum is in some, one, uh, some incomprehensible way bound up in his quest. Yes. Um, oh, wow, Joseph giving us the, the, the perfect, uh, this is the t-shirt that I want, right? Faramir with less doubt plus cooler sword equals Aragorn. Um, yeah, yeah. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? There would be an interesting bit of, of, uh, of, of textual comparison there, I think. Is Faramir in the book, because we haven't really talked about this, Faramir is served very poorly by the movies, by the movie adaptations of The Lord of the Rings. But would Faramir in the book be a closer analog to Aragorn in the book? Because Aragorn in the movies is more, sorry, would Faramir in the book be a closer parallel to Aragorn in the movies? Because Aragorn in the movies is beset by a kind of self-doubt and a kind of lack of identity, a kind of motive identity, a kind of definitive identity, I suppose. He's beset by those self, uh, by those doubts in the movie in a way that he absolutely isn't or, or is less so in the book. Maybe there is a certain parallel there between book Faramir and movie Aragorn. I think that's, 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 yeah, an interesting, an interesting point of comparison that we'll get to, of course, when we discuss the, uh, when we discuss the movies. Yes, good. All right, excellent. A sword brandishing contest suggests Barry Kovkant. Yeah, pretty good. Um, yes, Seastar says, yeah, film Faramir beats Gollum. Angry face. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think it is fair to say that film Faramir is the greatest breaking point in the film adaptations of The Lord of the Rings. He is, or if not the greatest, I think he is the greatest breaking point, right? Because those changes are, are intentional. Those are purposeful changes that are rolled upon his character by Peter Jackson and the production team behind the movies. That is a misstep. That is a bad choice. I think it is also the most ruinous choice that they make. So it is it is the, the least well-intentioned choice or like the least, uh, the least supported and substantiated choice in the movie adaptation, but also the most ruinous choice. Faramir is is trashed by the movie compared to the book version. I mean, he is probably still objectively a pretty solid character. It's been a while since I really paid close attention to Faramir because I tend to, you know, zone out and go and fix coffee while those scenes are happening. But uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much where we are. Okay, let's see here. Um, you know what? I I'm coming up on the uh, I'm coming up on my heart out here. Let's do one more slide as we have the surrendering of Gollum into Frodo's care. And then we'll we'll draw this week's session to a somewhat premature end, so that we can uh, so that we can uh, preserve the discussion of Minas Morgul and Kiddith Ongol and the actual transition into the crossroads for next week. Next week, then I think what I'll do, rather than pushing on, I think let's add an extra session, right? Just to kind of bring this discussion full circle. What is more appropriate for the fiftieth session of there and back again than to add an extra session into our discussion? Next week we'll finish up chapter six and we'll do chapter seven in more depth than I was originally planning. I would love to pull out some of the details of the landscape work that we get through chapter seven. It's just gorgeous. So we'll do a little bit of that next week. Let's first, though, focus on our final slide here. Faramir sat a moment in thought. Very good, he said at last. I surrender you to your master, to Frodo, son of Drogo. Let him declare what he will do with you. But Lord Faramir, said Frodo, bowing, you have not yet declared your will concerning the said Frodo, and until that is made known, he cannot shape his plans for himself or his companions. Your judgment was postponed until the morning, but that is now at hand. Then I will declare my doom, said Faramir. As for you, Frodo, insofar as lies in me under higher authority, I declare you free in the realm of Gondor to the furthest of its ancient bounds, save only that you neither excuse me, save only that neither you nor any that go with you have leave to come to this place unbidden. This doom shall stand for a year and a day and then cease, unless you shall before that term come to Ministerith and present yourself to the Lord and Steward of the city. Then I shall entreat him to confirm what I have done and to make it lifelong. In the meantime, whomsoever you take under your protection shall be under my protection and under the shield of Gondor. Are you answered? Frodo bowed low. I am answered, he said, and I place myself at your service if that is of any worth to one so high and honorable. It is of great worth, said Faramir. And now do you take this creature, this Smeagol, under your protection? I do take Smeagol under my protection, said Frodo. Sam sighed audibly. And not at the courtesies of which, as any hobbit would, he thoroughly approved. Indeed, in the Shire, such a matter would have required a great many more words and bows. 
Love that little beat of hobbitry that we get here at the end of this formal exchange. No, Sam, thrilled by the formal language and all of these formal declarations, as any hobbit would be. In fact, in the Shire, this would have taken four hours and seed cakes and coffee for all and many more words and bows. The formal exchange here is absolutely significant because this is not... Faramir is making a very bold choice here. He's making a courageous choice. It's a valiant choice here as, as a representative of Gondor in this matter. We know that the law demands that he kill Frodo, Sam, and Gollum. Indeed, even if the law doesn't demand that he kill Gollum outright, he has every reason to kill Gollum now that he knows more about this creature's existence. He has every reason to, at the very least, detain Frodo and Sam now that he knows about the existence of the ring. And they're their insane mission, their lunatic quest to go into Mordor and try to destroy it, two hobbits alone against the world. Oh no, not two hobbits alone, two hobbits alone with an evil and loathsome creature. But here, Faramir is doing that thing that Faramir does best. He is embodying the blood of ancient Numenor, refracted, refracted through the prism of Gondor here. He isn't abrogating his responsibility. He isn't diminishing his role here as the son of the steward Denethor or as a representative of the military might of Gondor here in the former holdings of, of, of Gondor here on the eastern bank of the Anduin here in Ithilien. Rather, he is formalizing that relationship. He is courageously here, valiantly here, extending the protection of Gondor and taking the burden of, of Frodo's future actions, of Frodo's goodness, of Frodo's faith upon himself. He will now, by extending this, this shield of protection, be answerable for Frodo. If Frodo falters, if Frodo loses, he will be culpable for that in some sense. I surrender you to this is the the I surrender you to your master to Frodo son of Drogo let him declare what he will do with you says Faramir first off honoring again Frodo with his formal name Frodo son of Drogo not Frodo Baggins we've left Frodo Baggins behind for quite some time now Frodo son of Drogo and Frodo responds in like kind but Lord Faramir said Frodo bowing crucially you have not yet declared your will concerning the said Frodo and until that is made known he cannot shape his plans for himself or his companions hey um there is the outstanding matter of what you're going to do with me then I will declare my doom, said Faramir. I will declare doom again, used in that archaic medieval sense. I will declare my judgment. Not I will decide, you'll note. Faramir has already decided. He isn't He isn't skipping ahead when he surrenders Smeagol into Frodo's keeping. That's the, He's already decided. I will declare my doom, said Faramir. As for you, Frodo, insofar as it lies in me under higher authority, I declare you free in the realm of Gondor to the furthest of its ancient bounds, save only that neither you nor any that go with you have leave to come to this place unbidden. You cannot return to Henethinen because it is a sacred and, and, and special place for the people of Gondor. Beyond that, the entire vastness of Gondor is open to you to the extent of its ancient bounds. You can go at the extent of its ancient bounds, parenthetically, up to and including Kirithungal, up to and including, you know, Minas Morgul. Like, yeah, you're free to go there. I can't stop you from going there because I have declared you free now, free within the country of Gondor. You are perilously close to being a citizen of Gondor. That doom shall stand for a year and a day. Another kind of evocation of medieval tradition there, where contracts traditionally lasted a year and a day. That is to like remove the ambiguity of the final day of the year. Like you are free for a year to travel the the, the length and breadth of my land. Well, does that mean, is, is that a year inclusive or a year exclusive of that final day? No. Traditionally in medieval contracts, a year and a day was the, the preordained term that would stand. Uh, the doom shall stand for a year and a day and then cease, doom again, judgment, the doom shall stand for a year and a day and then cease, unless you shall before that term come to Minas Tirith and present yourself to the Lord and Steward of the city, there I will entreat him to confirm what I have done and to make it lifelong. At that point, it is my will, it is my desire, it is my argument that you should be given the freedom of Gondor for the rest of your life, but that's not my decision to make. This is the limit of my authority. I can make you free within Gondor for a year and a day. In the meantime, whomsoever you take under your protection shall be under my protection and under the shield of Gondor. And remember, we've just talked about this reciprocal feudal relationship, right? You are going to be under my protection. You are going to, in some sense, honor me. You are going to, to bear fealty to me. You are going to, to be loyal to me, not serve me directly. I'm not going to give you instruction, Frodo, but you are now going to be part of, of 
part of my social structure and my social hierarchy. I will protect you. And that means that I am responsible for you. In turn, Frodo says, I am answered and I place myself at your service. If that is of any worth to one so high and honorable, it is of great worth, says Faramir. Again, the formal acknowledgement, but also, I think, a sincere acknowledgement of virtue. And now, do you take this creature, formalizing the question, do you, Frodo, in the manner that I have just taken you into my care and put you under my protection, do you take this creature, this Smeagol, under your protection? I do take Smeagol under my protection, said Frodo. And then we get the little hobbity beat, the, the, the wonderfully personal and informal beat of Sam sighing audibly. Sam, asterisk, eye roll, asterisk here, and not at the courtesies of which as any hobbit would he thoroughly approve. Like, Sam is in. Oh, can we just stand around all day making pretty speeches in formal language? Because that would be great. It's been a while since we've had that. And, of course, this is echoing Sam's uh, brief beat with Faramir at the end of the last, uh, the end of the last uh, chapter there. Uh, good, okay. Smallness is so important, a theme in Tolkien, says Andrea. Faramir simultaneously is great and nobler, while also becoming small and reducing his role in this quest by handing over these freedoms, right? Service, service is what gets you there. Yes, that's excellent. That's excellent, good. All right, guys, and with that... <laughs> <laughs> Joseph being a little cynical, uh, orcs show up. Frodo says, we're under the protection of Faramir, captain of Gondor in this land. Orcs kill Frodo and steal his stuff. Um, I mean, yes, but the, the, the gesture is still worth something, right? The gesture is still significant, but yes. And Angela observes, Sam's sigh of resignation is perfect. I am inclined to agree. Guys, that is going to do it for this week's session. So next week, let me cancel this slide. Excellent. Next week, we are going to look at the rest of chapter six and then all of chapter seven. That will be at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central. Let me double check that date because here at the beginning of February, I now can't keep track of anything. That will be at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central on February 7th, 2018. We'll just add a whole extra session. Basically, we're just burning an extra session on Faramir here and I regret nothing, you guys. Thank you all so, so much for joining me here for the 50th session of There and Back Again in which we talked a lot about Faramir and then added an extra session. Seems completely appropriate. I hope you all have a wonderful week. If you have thoughts on the things that we've discussed this week, if you have thoughts on Faramir, on virtue, on service, if you have questions about this part of the book or any other part of the book, then you can head on over to the Point North Media forums at pointnorthmedia.com slash forum and ask your questions there. It's a really great community and there are already some wonderful Tolkien discussions taking place over there. Also, if you have a moment, if you have just a little free cash to spare and you would like to support what I do here at Point North Media, you can head on over to Patreon at patreon.com slash pointnorthmedia. Pledge your support. And if you pledge your support within the next 48 hours there or thereabouts, then you will be able to join me this coming Saturday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central for a live chat discussion, a live commentary track, I suppose, of the 1999 adaptation of A Midsummer Night's Dream. That's the Kevin Klein, Callista Flockhart, Stanley Tucci, Christian Bale, Rupert Everett, like everyone, everyone, everyone is in that movie. We're going to talk about that movie. We're going to watch it all together and I'm going to talk all over it and talk a little about Shakespeare, talk a little about fairy, talk a little about love potions and their, their mythic roots and all of that good stuff. That is going to be open to all patrons of Point North Media this coming Saturday evening. Stay tuned for more information about that. That will do it for this live session of There and Back Again. I will talk to you all again soon. Until then, have a great week and fly, you fool! Oh,